Will one sin cause you to be lost? Will one transgression keep you from going to heaven? To add to the decibel level of this alarming question, we ask, will one transgression cause you to be lost eternally in the fire of hell? If you do not believe that one sin can cause this, then I ask you, how many sins would it take for you to lose your soul? Two, three, four, fifty, a hundred? God does not tell us in His Word how many sins will cause you to miss heaven, but we do not have to go very far in our Bible to see the consequence of just one sin. The first man was told by God when God had created all the trees in the garden that they were pleasant to look at, they were good for food. He said, you can freely eat of all of those trees except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You cannot partake of that tree. Because in Genesis 2, 17, that when you do, the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. In Genesis, the third chapter, we read where Satan deceived the first woman and tempting her to become wise as God, she succumbed to that temptation and she partook of that forbidden fruit, gave it to her husband, he did eat. And now we see the consequences. The day they ate thereof, they died spiritually. They then were cast out of the garden where the tree of life was, therefore to die physically later on. Devastating consequences of just one sin. In the New Testament, we read where the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. That happened to Adam and Eve. They suffered the spiritual separation from God, and consequently, they were deprived of physical life. They died physically later on. But we see that wages of sin is death, that indeed that could be just one sin. We're separated from God. And we have an example of that in Acts the 8th chapter. There was a man named Simon. He turned from his sorcery when he heard the gospel. And he became a baptized believer. He became a Christian in Acts 8 and verse 13. But when he saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, that spiritual gifts were given to other people, he wanted that power. And so he offered Peter and John, the two apostles, money to acquire that gift. Peter condemns him for that offer and condemns his heart. All that, let thy gold, let it perish with thee. But thy heart is not right before God. And what Peter began to tell him is that he was in a terrible spiritual condition. In Acts 8 and verse 23, we find that Peter said they're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That one sin was such wickedness that it was wicked at its root, that if you were to taste of that fruit, it would indeed be bitter. It was bitter from the root to its fruit. One sin. You're in the gall, bitterness, of this wickedness. And you're tied together, you're bound by iniquity. Not able to get out of that. You're in the bond of iniquity. How many sins did it take? Just one. And he was in a situation where he could not escape except he comply with the conditions of God's grace. Because Peter told him in Acts 8 and verse 22, repent of this sin that he had committed. Pray to the Lord that the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. There indeed was that way of getting out of that particular terrible situation of committing one sin. What's interesting to me is that Peter did not say, don't worry about it. You know, your sins were forgiven at the cross, both your past sins and also your future sins. You don't have to worry about one sin. Peter did not say that. He said, repent and pray to God that your thought of your heart would be forgiven thee. And what's interesting is that 
Peter says that you're in this state. But what Simon says, pray to the Lord for me, Peter, that the things that you speak thereof will not come upon me. Peter says you're in it. But Simon says, I don't want these things to happen to me. In 1 John 5, 16 and 17, I think we have an answer to this situation. How come he could be in it and yet hasn't come upon him yet? What John says is that there is a sin not unto death. And if you see your brother sinning a sin not unto death, you can pray to God for him and God will give him life. But there is a sin unto death. And God says, don't you pray for him who has committed this sin unto death. All unrighteousness is sin. But there is a sin that is not unto death. What does he mean by that? We think we see the problem of sin and even in the Old Testament when Jeremiah is told by God, don't pray for my people. Do not cry out unto me for their, on their behalf. Do not make intercession to me. I will not hear thee. Because they weren't going to repent. They were going to stay in that sin. In fact, their families were working together to provide sacrifices for idolatrous gods and to false gods. Don't pray for them anymore, Jeremiah. I will not hear your prayer. That's what John is saying. What is the sin that is unto death? It is any sin that we'll refuse to repent of. And there is a sin not unto death that we can pray for forgiveness. Why? Because we're going to repent of that sin. Before we can repent, we need to confess it. Because in 1 John 1 and verse 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us of our transgressions and sins and can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have to admit it. We have to speak with God that, yes, well, I have sinned, God. I'm going to turn from that. I'm going to repent. And I pray that you will forgive me. God is faithful to forgive us of all our iniquities. But we're interested in this one sin with Peter and Simon. And Simon says, pray for me that these things will not come upon me. The sin that is not unto death, it's interesting in 1 John 5, 16, is because when God answers that prayer, because you're repenting, he'll give you life. I thought the sin was not unto death. It is in one sense because we're separated from God when we sin one sin. But the eternal consequences have not occurred yet. God gives us an opportunity that when we commit that one sin, that we can confess and we can repent and pray and God will forgive us and restore us on that way of eternal life. And that is God's grace. God's grace is not seen in the sense, I've forgiven you of all your sins in the future, and you don't have to worry about it. No, you need to confess it and repent and pray for forgiveness. And God's grace is that His Son's blood is still available for you, dear Christian. That when you commit that one sin, you don't have to be longer in the bond of iniquity and the gall of bitterness and to be suffering the consequences of being lost eternally in hell. What we see from the Old and New Testament is that God does not tell us that, well, one sin will not cause you to be lost. God does not tell us that in the cross and through the cross, all of our future sins are automatically forgiven at the cross, that you don't have to worry about it. God has told us that when we commit that one sin, confess it, repent, and pray, and God will forgive us. That is a wonderful blessing that God gives us. And may we learn from the Old and New Testament the consequences of one sin. It causes one to be separated from God. It drove the first man and woman out of the Garden of Eden where they could not partake of the Tree of Life. It caused Simon the sorcerer, the thought of his heart, that one sin caused him to be in a gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And he asked Peter to pray for him that this situation would not be on his record as he goes into eternity to suffer the consequences of being in that one sin. These are sobering words, yet they're very instructive. Thank you for stopping by.